Hello, I'm Dr. DeBellis, and today I'd like to talk to you about the chemical basis of behavior. We've already spoken about the electrical basis of behavior, particularly neurophysiology, as well as the different parts of the, of the neuron and the brain. Now I'd like to talk to you about what happens in the synapse, particularly what is a neurotransmitter. Neurochemistry focuses on the basic chemical composition and processes of the nervous system. Um, neurochemistry is more focused on endogenous ligands, whereas neuropharmacology is the study of compounds that selectively affect the nervous system, and it's more focused on exogenous ligands. In this presentation, we'll be focusing on the former, on neurochemistry. And we're going to be talking mostly about neurotransmitters and how they operate. Hopefully you'll recall from our last lecture that a ligand is a substance that binds to a receptor molecule where it has an effect. The endogenous ligands are produced inside the body, and we'll focus on them in more detail. And exogenous ligands such as drugs are produced outside the body, and they'll be the topic of our next presentation. Now, receptor subtypes may trigger very different responses in target cells, and drugs can be designed that affect only one specific subtype, such as neuroleptic medications. We know that neuroleptic or antipsychotic medications um, are so useful because they antagonize a specific type of dopamine receptor called the dopamine 2 receptor. Now, co-localization is when more than one neurotransmitter exists in a given presynaptic terminal. So here we have a presynaptic terminal, and as you can see, this vesicle here is filled with dopamine. The one below with the purple neurotransmitter, this vesicle is filled with norepinephrine. Six criteria need to be met in order to classify a molecule as a tr true neurotransmitter. The first is a true neurotransmitter exists in the presynaptic axon terminals. Uh, you can see those red spheres there. Those are going to represent neurotransmitter. If we look down here at receptor, um, we're going to have these little um, purple receptors, which we're going to mostly see on the postsynaptic membrane. The blue spheres, which we'll get to, those are antagonists. What they do is they, they block a receptor so it can't be activated. And finally, the graded potential, which we talked about in Chapter 2, that's going to represent um, a, a local or a graded potential that happens in the postsynaptic neuron. So a true neurotransmitter exists in the presynaptic axon terminals. True neurotransmitters are also synthesized by enzymes in the presynaptic cells. So the presynaptic cells are capable of producing them inside the body. That's what makes them endogenous. True neurotransmitters are released when action potentials reach the axon terminals. So here we can see that the neurotransmitter is released into the synapse. Um, now true ne neurotransmitters have matching receptors on the postsynaptic membrane. And here we can see those receptors. And uh, neurotransmitters, or ligands, fit into the receptors, like, like keys in a lock. Um, and they have to have a certain shape in order to activate a specific receptor. True neurotransmitters can produce postsynaptic potentials, or PSPs, we'll call them. And here we can see whenever each neurotransmitter hits a receptor, it causes a little graded potential. If you think back to that voltage curve that we had earlier, basically um, this is a slight fluctuation. Now, um, the graded potential can be positive or negative. It can depolarize or hyperpolarize, um, but it's a graded potential. It's not necessarily going to lead to an action potential like we saw in the previous chapter. True neurotransmitters can't produce postsynaptic potentials when blocked. So this is the sixth criteria for a true neurotransmitter. So, and here we see these blue spheres. These represent antagonists. 
they go in and they, they actually block the receptor so that the neurotransmitter, whenever it tries to um, activate the receptor, it's denied entry. So we're going to divide um, neurotransmitters into several classes. Um, first up at the top we see acetylcholine, which is a quaternary amine. Then we have the monoamines. The monoamines usually get a lot of attention. You probably heard about these in your intro to psychology class if you took one. These are going to be catecholamines and endolamines. Now, the catecholamines are going to be norepinephrine, epinephrine, dopamine. I have an acronym that you can use uh, as, a, as a mnemonic strategy to remember these. Uh, we also have the endolamines. Um, these are going to be serotonin and melatonin, which we're going to talk about in more detail like most of these. And then we have amino acid neurotransmitters, such as GABA, glycine, glutamate, and aspartate. Then we're going to talk about peptide neurotransmitters, such as opioids and oxytocin. Um, and we'll talk about oxytocin in even more detail when we talk about hormones as they affect the, the brain and behavior. And then finally, gas neurotransmitters, such as nitric oxide, carbon dioxide, so we'll talk about these in more detail. To remember catecholamines, I like the acronym NED the CAT. NED is the acronym NED, which stands for norepinephrine, epinephrine, and dopamine. Hopefully that'll be useful. Um, for endolamines, I guess you could use the acronym MS for melatonin and ser serotonin or S and M, whatever helps you to remember it. Um, hopefully you can remember the catecholamines and the endolamines because these are particularly relevant to the field of psychology. Now neurotransmitters affect targets by acting on receptors and receptors are protein molecules in the postsynaptic membrane. Ionotropic receptors are fast and they open an ion channel when the transmitter molecule binds. So they open the receptor and an ion is allowed to pass in to the postsynaptic space. Now, keep in mind, the neurotransmitter is not actually going to enter. It's just going to open that opening. It's going to serve as a ligand. The ion's actually what's going to go in. And it can be a cation if it's positively charged. It can be an anion if it's negatively charged. Metabotropic receptors, on the other hand, they tend to be slower. Sometimes I joke about them being the DMV receptors. They take a lot longer to, to do their job. Sometimes it seems like if you go to the DMV, you don't usually get out of there real quick, right? Um, when activated, metabotropic receptors alter chemical reactions in the cells, such as the G protein system, to open the ion channel. So. Here we have an ionotropic receptor down below, as you can see. And here's a neuro, here is a neurotransmitter. I don't know which one it is, but as you can see, the neurotransmitter eventually is drawn toward the appropriate receptor. And then whenever it binds, the ionotropic receptor opens. Again, this, this is a quick acting receptor. An ion is allowed to pass through which is going to cause a slight graded potential in the postsynaptic neuron. Now the metabotropic receptors, again, they're slow, and when activated, they alter a chemical reaction in the cell. Um, so here's a neurotransmitter hitting a metabotropic receptor, which then releases the G protein, which travels in the intracellular space, and then it latches onto the interior of this channel here, and opens it up, and whenever it opens, an ion can enter through that opening into the intracellular space. So we have different subtypes for neurotransmitter receptors uh, for each neurotransmitter. For instance, we have 14 for serotonin. We have five for norepinephrine. We also have five for dopamine. But the different subtypes are constantly changing their concentrations in response to behavior. Um, and this is one of the things that allows for 
neuroplasticity, which we talked about in a previous chapter. Now, pharmaceutical drugs exploit the fact that certain drugs target certain subtypes, leading to specific effects associated with that subtype. I gave the example earlier of um, dopamine 2 receptors. If we can antagonize those, that's going to reduce positive symptoms of schizophrenia. And this is exactly what we see with a lot of antipsychotic medications, such as the one below, Haldol, the affinity to dopamine 2 receptors, uh, which it then antagonizes, uh, is one of the reasons that it's such a powerful antipsychotic medication. An agonist initiates the normal effects of the receptor. So I said we could think of a ligand as a key. There's a picture of my son there. He's taking a key and he's putting it into a keyhole. That's the way an agonist works. If you can actually put the key in, then open the door, it opens almost like an ion channel. Now an antagonist blocks the receptor from being activated by other ligands. So if you put a um, shield on an electric outlet that blocks it, or maybe you put some yellow cones in a parking space so nobody can use it, that would be antagonizing it. And an inverse agonist initiates the effect that's opposite of the normal function. So it, it's like an agonist. It goes in. It doesn't block the receptor. It just causes the opposite reaction whenever it's activated. And we call that an inverse agonist. So we're going to talk about these amine neurotransmitters. Um, we're going to talk about serotonin. We're going to talk about dopamine. We're going to talk about norepinephrine. And finally, we're going to talk about acetylcholine. If I give you an oversimplified Venn diagram, um, I think that this is a useful way to approach the material because it's, it's going to get a little bit complicated. And, and if you look at it on a simplified level, I think this is a way of looking at it. Each of these neurotransmitters is produced in the midbrain tegmentum. As you can see, dopamine is, serotonin, acetylcholine, and norepinephrine are all produced in the midbrain tegmentum. So it's the common production site, right? However, each of these neurotransmitters has an additional uh, area of production. For serotonin, we have the Raffe nuclei. For acetylcholine, the basal forebrain. So acetylcholine is produced in the midbrain tegmentum as well as the basal forebrain. The locus cerealis and the midbrain tegmentum produce norepinephrine. Uh, and finally, the basal ganglia and the midbrain tegmentum produce dopamine. Um, in these lectures, I'm usually going to use epinephrine and norepinephrine interchangeably uh, for the purpose of this course. So first we're going to talk about acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is a quaternary amine, and it plays a role in cognition muscle contraction, and activation of the parasympathetic response, which, as you recall, is the rest and digest response. Um, antagonists such as scopolamine interfere with learning and memory. Um, in the 1600s, as, as late as the 1600s, the antagonist Karari was still being used as an anesthetic. Um, it actually wasn't... Um, getting rid of pain. It was actually interfering with muscle contractions, which is kind of a scary idea that it was being used as an anesthetic. The black widow spider uh, uses venom that's a potent agonist in, in these um, acetylcholine receptors, and botulism toxins inhibit its release. You're probably familiar, if, if you've studied um, Alzheimer's disease, that we have a class of medications, cholinergic medications, such as uh, Aricep, um, Razodyne, and Exelon, which actually um, decrease the enzyme that breaks uh, the Aricept into choline and acetic acid, thereby lengthening the life of the Aricept in the synapses. Theoretically, the idea is that we can increase 
levels of Aricep and that that will actually um, reduce the amount of forgetting and cognitive dysfunction that we have in the early stages of Alzheimer's disease. Now, acetylcholine um, can, can activate two types of receptors. Nicotonic receptors are ionotropic, so they're quicker acting. And then we have muscarinic receptors that are metabotropic. Um, some might notice, ooh, nicotonic, that sounds like nicotine. Yes, actually, that is how uh, the, the effect that you have, that you experience if you smoke cigarettes, that, that rest and digest response is actually from these receptors being activated. Um, and acetylcholine is produced in the midbrain and the basal forebrain. So if we look at a mid-sagittal section of the brain and we try to identify where is the acetylcholine being produced and then where does it go from there? Um, acetylcholine is produced in two places. As I talked about, the midbrain uh, tegmentum is where all these amine neurotransmitters are produced. And if we look, we see the um, pedunculopontine nucleus. And the pedunculopontine nucleus produces this neurotransmitter, which is then going to make its way um, down into the pons as well. And it's also even going to go into the cerebellum. Now the second site of production um, is going to be the basal forebrain. And from the basal forebrain, the acetylcholine is actually going to make its way um, into the cortex, into the frontal regions, right? It's also going to make its way uh, more posterior as well in the cortex. And don't forget, another part of the cortex is also going to rely on acetylcholine and that's actually going to be the hippocampus, which is actually going to be down in the um, inferior areas of the temporal lobes. So these are the areas where acetylcholine is produced, in the pudunculo, pontine nucleus, and the basal forebrain. Now we're going to talk about another amine neurotransmitter, dopamine. You're probably familiar. Dopamine... Um, is associated with reward pathways, schizophrenia, attention deficit disorder, many different things. Um, it's found in neurons in the midbrain and the basal ganglia, and there are five dopamine receptors. Um, and it's broken down by catechol O methyltransferase, which we're going to call COMPT. Um, and this pathway is important in motor control, cognition, and reward. This pathway is implemented into um, schizophrenia, movement disorders such as Parkinson's disease and Huntington's disease and hemibolismus, as well as uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Uh, it was noted uh, by Robert Sapolsky in a book that he wrote in 2017 that variants that produce low, lower dopamine signaling, less dopamine in the synapse, fewer dopamine receptors or lower responsiveness of these receptors are associated with sensation seeking, risk taking, and attentional problems and extroversion. Now much research is focused on the dopamine 4 receptor. Uh, the gene is DRD4 and it comes in 10 flavors. Version with 7 repeats produces a receptor protein that's sparse in the cortex and nearly unresponsive to dopamine. Um, this has been associated with promiscuity, sensation and novelty seeking, extroversion alcoholism, less sensitive parenting, and again, attention issues. Um, but it seems like situation and parenting um, also moderate the effect. So it's not what the gene does, it's what the gene does in a specific context, and that's really important to keep in mind. If we think about where dopamine is produced, again, let's go back to our initial Venn diagram that we used, um, that dopamine would be produced like all other amine neurotransmitters in the midbrain tegmentum, 
as well as an accessory site. In this case, it's going to be in the basal ganglia. And we're going to call that area uh, the nigrostriatal area. And the ni nigrostriatal area produces dopamine, and then the dopamine is actually going to go into the basal ganglia. I'm going to call that the nigrostriatal. So that means this is dopamine that's going to be particularly important for movement since, as we learned in chapter two, the basal ganglia are really important for movement. We also have the mesolimbocortical area, uh, where another area where dopamine is produced. And the mesolimbocortical area is actually going to go into the limbic system. Actually, you can also divide the mesolimbocortical into the mesolimbic and the mes mesocortical. And some research does that whenever we're trying to understand which networks are more um, implemented or are, are, are more afflicted by conditions such as schizophrenia versus ADHD. So this is what that would actually look like. So the dopamine makes its way throughout the cortex from the through the mesolimbocortical area. Now we're going to talk about norepinephrine. Norepinephrine is released in the locus cerealis in the midbrain, and it's also known as uh, noradrenaline. Um, the cells producing it are norandrenergic, but it plays the prominent role in the sympathetic response, which is the, the fight or flight response, also referred to as the tend or befriend response. Um, but the central nervous system has four types of norepinephrine receptors, and they're all metabotropic. The norepinephrine systems modulate processes ranging from mood, level of arousal, and sexual behavior. And if we want to look at where norepinephrine is actually produced, this lateral tegmental area is an area where a lot of it's produced. Um, and from that particular area, it's going to go to the pons. It's also going to make its way to the cerebellum and down into the brainstem. We also have the locus cerealis. And the locus cerealis is going to send norepinephrine up into more cortical areas. So it's going to make its way around there and make its way up into the cortex. Finally, serotonin. And the actions of serotonin are quite complicated. So it's also known as 5-hydroxytryptamine. It's a monoamine neurotransmitter. It's, it's classified as an endolamine, and it's synthesized from tryptophan. Now, it's implicated into a range of behaviors such as sleep, sexual behavior, mood, and anxiety. And antidepressants such as Prozac increase activity with effects depending on which receptor subtype is affected. While the actual biological functioning is complex and multifaceted, modulating cognition, reward, learning, and memory, and numerous physiological processes such as vomiting and uh, vasoconstriction, most of it's found in the enteric nervous system. I believe it's like 90% of it, and it's produced in the Raffae nuclei in the brainstem, which we're going to see in a moment, but the remainder synthesize in neurons of the central nervous system where it has various functions. These include the regulation of sleep, appetite, and mood. Um, serotonin also has some cognitive functions, including memory and learning, and it's also been implemented into personality traits such as agreeableness, conscientiousness, and uh, neuroticism by Colin de Young. It's found in all bilateral animals, and it plays a 
a role in perceived resources and social dominance. Um, I think we spoke in a previous lecture about how serotonin levels seem to be elevated in vervet monkeys that, that had a higher ranking um, in, in their tribe. Uh, it's also been found that it increases in lobsters whenever a lobster um, competes with another lobster and wins, um, thereby winning a particular piece of space. But humans have 14 receptor variants, which have a range of effects on appetite, mood, anxiety, sleep, body temperature, eating behavior, sexual behavior, movements, and gastrointestinal motility. And it's typically reuptaken after activating a receptor by CERT or PMAT. Um, CERT stands for serotonin reuptake transporter. Um, now, a caveat, serotonin is not simply the depression neurotransmitter. Colin de Young's research demonstrates that serotonin plays a role in conscientiousness, agreeableness, and neuroticism, which comprise the, the construct he calls stability. And on a side note, dopamine levels are more involved in extroversion and openness to experience a construct that he calls flexibility. So when it comes to the production of serotonin, we have, again, two places. If you go back to that Venn diagram, which is a gross oversimplification intended to make the, ear, the uh, material more manageable, um, it's going to be produced in the midbrain tegmentum, and then it's also going to be produced in another site. And in the case of serotonin, we're going to call that other site the Raffae nuclei. So here's the midbrain tegmentum site right here. This is a, the mesencephalic serotonergic cells. Those are going to be in the midbrain. And, and those are actually going to make their way um, up into the cortex the thalamus so it's going to make their way up into the cortex and through the cortex right as i said before we also have the raffae nuclei and the raffae nuclei are going to supply the um, serotonin to the pons, the cerebellum, and down to the spinal cord. Now we also have amino acid neurotransmitters. Uh, glutamate and aspartate are the most plentiful excitatory neurotransmitters of the central nervous system. Glutamate triggers a AMPA kinate and MMDA receptors, which are all metabotropic. We're going to talk about these in a lot more detail. In the next lecture, we're going to actually talk about NMDA receptors um, whenever we talk about some of the new innovative treatments that are being used for depression. Excitotoxicity is a neural injury, such as a stroke or head injury, uh, that can cause excess release of glutamate which is toxic to neurons. It will destroy the neurons. Um, another amino acid neurotransmitter is going to be GABA or gamma aminobutyric acid. Um, it and glycine are the major inhibitory neurotransmitters of the central nervous system. GABA antagonists are potent tranquilizers, and their inverse agonists can cause seizures. Um, GABA A and C receptors are inhibitory ionotropic receptors, whereas GABA B is inhibitory metabotropic. Um, and, and most drugs that slow down the central nervous system have some sort of an impact on these GABA receptors. Endorphins are endogenous opioid peptides, and they're produced in the pituitary and hypothalamus during exercise, pain, Spicy, uh, spicy food consumption and sex. Um, endorphins are responsible for 
a phenomenon that's been uh, termed the runner's high. When an individual runs for 10 miles or so and afterward they report that they feel high. Sometimes they'll even have visual disturbances. Um, that's because endorphins are sort of like an endogenous version of, of opium. They hit the same receptors and uh, they lead to this pleasant feeling that many people experience after intense periods of exercise. Finally, I want to talk about neuromodulators. Neuromodulators, and we're going to talk about them in more detail, especially when we talk about the most popular drug in America, which is coffee. Uh, it works through um, antagonizing modulators. But we're, before we get to that point in our next lecture, I want to talk about what are neuromodulators. So neuromodulators affect either the transmitter release or the receptor response. And the way that they do that, if we look down below, we're going to say our neuromodulators are, we have the, these, this little tracer neuron that's packed in with the other neurotransmitters. Um, and what ends up happening is whenever the neurotransmitters are released, this neuromodulator is released with it, and what it does is it goes back to the presynaptic membrane and it hits one of these receptors that, that's selective to it. And when the neuromodulator activates this autoreceptor, we'll call it, there's less production of the neurotransmitter, in this case the red neurotransmitter, whatever it is. Basically it's produced in less, it's less abundant um, whenever the um, neuromodulator activates the autoreceptor. This is something we're going to talk about more in the next lecture.